Our Father and our God, we stand in thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for another opportunity to worship you in praise and in the study of your word. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would set this time aside for each heart that's gathered here. You know every one of our needs. I ask that the Holy Spirit be the teacher, that he would strip away that which is not true but seal to our hearts that which is. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse, and in our last study together here, we had reached the 19th verse of the fourth chapter. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, and I expect that we'll finish Philippians with this this part of uh, our study, part 29, I believe. I'm not sure why the epistle is addressed to the believers at Philippi, but it's, it's a marvelous little letter. So I want to go through the entire epistle in review, looking at the subject matter of each of the chapters until we reach the 19th verse of chapter 4. I want you all to note, first of all, that the epistle is addressed to the saints. The saints. We are assured that the saints are in Christ Jesus. And what a fabulous position of security. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how the epistle opens. And that grace and that peace is the subject of the first chapter. We have absolute confidence in God and, and in His performance and what He's done on our behalf. Many Christians today are not being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That is, until the day the Lord returns. We are assured that, first of all, we did not begin any work in a, ourselves God began it and yet the prominent message that we seem to hear today the theme that we seem to hear today is if you will initiate some process if you will just do something God will finish it you know God of course we know God would never override your will you must be the one who makes the first approach and then God will be eager to answer even though Paul in Romans says that no man seeks after God and that somehow seems to be the humanistic message that we hear. Yet God has shown us here, if you follow through this study, you have seen that He has shown us that, that He began the work, and not only did He begin it, but that He absolutely will finish it. And we see that in Hebrews. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we can be confident that He who began it will finish it. And as a result of that simple and yet profound truth, we know that the, the fruit of righteousness is by Jesus Christ, not by our works, not by our diligence, our discipline, our consecration, our efforts, you know, expended in any area, but by Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ. And it, it is a singular fruit of, the, of righteousness. It's not fruits of righteousness, it's fruit of righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ. There's none righteous but God. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. So at the very opening of this epistle, our eyes have already been lifted above. Where Christ sits at the right hand of God, the finished, the perfect, finished work of Christ, where confidence is placed in God, who started something, and we'll absolutely finish it. We saw that we're called saints. We're called saints not because God hopes that we will at some point become saints, but because God made us saints. He made us righteous in, the, in our Lord Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And yet so many Christians have failed to grasp that fact. They've, they've failed to, 
to, to grasp it or refuse to grasp it. You know, Paul may be righteous. David may be righteous. Billy Graham, you know, may have been righteous, but not me. Not the way I live. Not the way I act. Not the way I think. You know, surely I'm not righteous. Yet God says that you are. And who can lay any charge against you? Who, who will condemn you? It is God who declared you righteous. Based upon, not something that you did, but based upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did. It's God who works in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. If we could just, folks, once settle our thoughts and minds on that tremendous truth, it would remove so much of the Christian neurosis that we see on every hand. It's God who works in us both the will and to do of His good pleasure. You know, I wouldn't think that by you know, looking at uh, the life of Paul with all that the Lord brought him through. Why was this true in Paul's life for the furtherance of the Gospel? The Holy Spirit surely makes it clear that we are not here for our attainments but for our good and and for the further and for the further ends of the gospel we find in the first chapter that it's needful for us to be here if it were not god would have taken us to glory you know where that we would be in intimate and unbroken fellowship with him forever but it's good for us to be here. We know it's good for us to be here. And the Holy Spirit is here with us. We have that comfort given us in this epistle. And when we have finished our course here, then we'll depart and we will be with Him. And, be, and it's because of this truth. We're not intimidated. We're not terrified by our adversaries because that is an evident token of their ruin from God. Okay? That's an evidence from God of their ruin and our deliverance. How, how does that deliverance work out? Folks, you are being counterfeited. Okay? Nobody counterfeits something that's not of, of value. I mean, the very fact that something is counterfeited is evidence that you have great value. What proves that dollar bill in your wallet to be of value is that it's counterfeited. If it had no value, it wouldn't be counterfeited. And if, and if you had no adversities, if you had no adversities, if you had no difficulties, well, we wouldn't know what it was like to suffer for Christ's sake. Dearly beloved, if we had no trials, no hardships, no difficulties, no suffering, no sorrow, no pain here, if we, if we, didn't, have any, if we didn't have that, we would be tremendously suspicious of this life and this fellowship and communion that that we have with our Father and with our Lord Jesus Christ. He advised His disciples, marvel not that the world system hates you. It, ha it hates me. It hated me. And I live within you. And if it hates me, it's going to hate you because I dwell in you. It doesn't hate you because of, of who you are, you know, or the way you dress, the way you think, the way you talk. It, it hates you because I chose you. And you are mine. You have adversaries, but you're not intimidated by them because you know that God has given you two things. He's given you the opportunity to trust, to believe. And He's given you the opportunity to suffer for His namesake. I think God did a wonderful thing in love you know, to first of all give us the opportunity to trust Him and secondly to give us the opportunity to suffer for His namesake. I don't believe He did that because He hates us, but because He loves us. In chapter 2, we are urged to let this bind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The rejoicing in that realization that He died in, in your place, therefore you cannot die. When the majority of professing Christianity today believes that we could go to hell, you know, if we wanted to, or that we're going to heaven because we did something, and, and if, but if we do something else, then, you know, we'll go to hell. And that, fo that lie, folks, okay, because that's what it is, has failed to grasp the marvelous reality, the realization that Jesus Christ died in our place. And if He did, we cannot die. 
And because he died in our place and he rose from the dead, God has highly exalted him. Dearly beloved, the most important time frame on God's calendar is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything centers around that. All of God's Word is centered in the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's not a history book. It's not a scientific textbook. It's not a theological workbook. Nor is it a day menu for the daily activities of your life. What it is, is it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He died for us, and God highly exalted Him. And it's because of this that we can fellowship together. It's not you doing this and me doing that and you know, and we each have our own idea of what ought to be done. And, and we may or may not be able to work together, but the truth is that it's God who's working in us, and that can be the very basis of our working together, our fellowship together. So we began in chapter 3, and uh, seeing that in that fellowship that we have together, we are to be aware, beware of merit. You're surrounded with it. You are surrounded with a desire for merit. You go to meetings where, you know, it's how many souls have you saved this week? How many dollars have you given for Christ? You know, how much are you willing to sacrifice and work and all of the other guile and bait and deceit that's coupled with the Word of God? Be aware of merit. So it was no surprise to see that God gave us a supreme example of merit in Paul. Hebrew of the Hebrews. That's to say that, that he's not only a Hebrew, but both his mother and his father were Hebrews. Tribe of Benjamin, one of the faithful tribes, you know, Judah and Benjamin. A member of the Sanhedrin who excelled above others in his own nation. We are told in Galatians that he was more zealous of the traditions of the fathers than anyone else. And we saw the Holy Spirit say that these things are to be regarded is not only worthless, but as manure. Garbage. How could, how could we put anything, folks, alongside what Christ has done? Our passion is not wrapped up in what we do or what we should do. Our passion is wrapped up in that we may know Him, that, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not that I, I, I might know how to do righteous acts, since the Christian's life is centered in the person and the work of Christ. That I may know Him. He died in my place. The power of His resurrection. Had He not risen from the dead, I would not be made righteous. God made us righteous in Christ. It was not the, the fact that Abraham believed God that made him righteous. The fact that he believed God is what showed him to already be righteous. And had not God made him righteous, he could not have been shown to be righteous. God clearly declared He would not call that righteous which is unrighteous, nor call that unrighteous which is righteous. Therefore, if He has not made you righteous in Christ, He cannot call you righteous. And if He has made you righteous in Christ, He can't call you unrighteous. Dearly beloved, I don't run into very many Christians who know that they're righteous. And I'm going to tell you that one truth can change the entire aspect of a Christian's life. The power of His resurrection. Uh, but what we want to do is take something that, that I think is tremendously significant and turn it around to the manure in the trash, all that garbage that we left in the third chapter. The power of His resurrection. That's the person that goes forth with his chest stuck out, who fights all the enemies of God like some mighty warrior who, who slays dragons and saves thousands of souls every week. Right? I mean, look, just look at that transformed man walking in the power of the resurrection. But folks, I don't see that in the text. 
I don't see that in the text. I see Christians who profess to know Christ who have never come to the simple acceptance of the clear statement of fact of the Word of God that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, He rose from the dead because they had already been made righteous. If you don't realize you're as righteous as Christ, you don't know where you're walking because you're walking in darkness, not light. And anybody who's known me for one day knows that I'm, I am not inferring that that person is not redeemed. I mean, you wouldn't say, well, if you don't know that you have freedom in America, well, then you have no right to the name American. I mean, you wouldn't say that. That doesn't mean that you're not an American. It just simply means you fail to grasp one of the most basic facts of our particular democracy. What I'm trying to say is, is I want Christians to understand that in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has finished making you righteous. Okay? And if you're going to take the name Christian, take what the name means. One who belongs to Christ in whose place He died. And when He rose from the dead, He declared you righteous. It is this God who works in us. We fellowship together, not in the area of merit. I mean, that's what we count as but garbage. We may know Him, the power of His resurrection, the certainty of His finished work for us, the fellowship of His sufferings. And I'm more than willing to agree that that, that may be coupled you know, to your being uh, criticized for preaching or believing in, the, in Christ as your own Redeemer. But more than that, I believe it's the realization that when He was crucified, we were crucified with Him. When He died, we died with Him. When He was buried, we were buried with Him. And when He rose, we rose with Him to walk in newness of life. Why newness of life? Because when He was raised from the dead, it was because we had been made righteous. Folks, this amazing epistle is the most marvelous love letter that God, I believe, that God could ever and I'm, give us. And, and I'm not trying to minimize any other epistle or any other passage of Scripture. I believe that, that what it means to know the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. I mean, this is... The, those precious truths, folks, do not merge very well with human merit. In fact, those who use merit are... We, are, we were told that they are mutilating the body of Christ. Conformable unto His death. It was, it was the realization... That that's the way God satisfied the sin debt. You know, the way that we were reconciled to God. Okay, we were then told, we were then told to set our minds on these things. Let us therefore, as many of us who are mature, God wants us to be mature, to be spiritual, not living under the old man, the flesh, law. You are not under law, you're under grace. Then you have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy. Uh, folks, there's no law against love. There's no law against goodness. There's no law against faith. There's no law against meekness, gentleness, long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is contrasted with the sphere of law with the things of the flesh which were made conformable to His death. So we set our minds as mature people on this concept. And we live then as those who realize what God has done for us in Christ. So we moved into chapter 4 and we saw that based upon all that, that's the way we ought to work together. That isn't the way Christians work together. But that's the way God wants us to work together. And if, if we understand what we've learned in the first three chapters, then we, we, don't, we don't have any difficulty working together because we are the same mind as one another. And we need one another. And because we work with one another. And no one man, person, has a corner on truth. So we work together realizing that what is done, which, that, you know, that, that which is done, which should be done, is being done by God. If I make, if I make the assumption, and, and I want to put a big if there, if I make the assumption that I'm theologically perfect, 
then I'll probably find it very dif difficult to work with any of you. I may not be able to work with you if your belief system has gone far afield of the, of the realm of the Word of God. That's pretty obvious. But if, if you don't believe Jesus was God, that He was just a good man martyred for a good cause, then, well, you and I would, would probably have difficulty working together because we just don't speak the same language. In which case, fellowship is near impossible. But they, that may not mean that we are to, to separate from one another. Okay, It doesn't mean that this other person in front of me is not redeemed. If you are in error, I mean, who do I have to minister to? If I'm in error, who do you have to minister to? If, if not one another and vice versa. The, the idea that the Holy Spirit presented was that we're laboring together in the Gospel, this fabulous concept that, that Christ died in our place. We've settled our minds on that. We don't argue that at all. We rejoice in the fact that we are working together with other believers in Christ, and we don't worry about anything. That's a toughie. We don't worry about anything. Don't be concerned about anything. But in everything, in the prayer, the worship, the, the supplication, in everything, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If your great concern is that everybody agrees with you, then that's, that's not a very peaceful environment. Until you've, well, you know, until you've beaten them all down to agree with you. I hope it's clear, at least to those of you who keep listening to Blessed Hope Forever, that, that you're not here to agree or disagree with me. Folks, the truth is this book, not what you hear me say. God works in us both the will and to do of His good pleasure and what He began in us He'll finish. If we simply just take God at His word, folks, in four very short chapters, we'll set our mind on things above, not on things below, our former way of life, our former way of thinking. That, that was our former way of thinking, folks. These are the things that are lovely, pure, honorable, and, and, and so forth. Why? Because they're all centered in Christ. And I don't think that the, the things that are pure, you know, is being set in contrast with some debauched, you know, lifestyle. You know, things that are honest versus dishonest and so forth. And I'm not suggesting that that's wrong, folks, but I believe in a higher sense those verses speak of the things above. My affection settled on things concerning Christ. And then this, this ends in an area that seems to be totally unrelated. Giving and receiving. And that's where we were the last video. I don't, and I don't believe that the giving and the receiving there is limited to just money. And money seems to be the driving force in almost every Christian organization on the planet. The process of giving and receiving is twofold. You can't give without receiving. You can't receive without giving. And it's absolutely a part of fellowship and communion with other believers. That need uh, may or may not be money. It may be a kind word. It might be a helping hand. It might be somebody who needs your pickup to move their furniture on a Sunday. Okay? It might be food, water, clothing. I don't know, but it's interesting to me that God couples giving and receiving together. What I do know is if we give or receive anything, there should not be the tiniest, slightest bit of human merit associated with it. And whatever we give or receive, it is God we know who supplied it. And He supplied it through Jesus Christ. He, he filled a need for fruit in one case and, he, and the need for something else in the other. God shall fill all of your need according to the riches, to, the, to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's how He does it. Some way, God's going to meet your need, whatever it is. And then it is to God, folks, that we give the glory forever and ever. And we are to salute every saint in Christ Jesus. And I don't think that's the military term, really. It might be. I don't, what we do is salute the saints that agree with us. Is that what we do? 
Folks, greeting doesn't mean that we share some aspect of truth in common, but, but we're told to salute every saint. You know, there's smart saints, there's dumb saints, pretty saints, ugly saints, filthy saints, clean saints, and I don't, you know, and, and on and on that goes. Greet every saint. And folks, I praise God for all of the criticism that I've received, and I praise Him for the loving encouragement that I've also received. There are people I have known, particularly in this fellowship, who have the kindest way of pointing out some of my ignorance. And I absolutely praise the Lord for that. For those of you who do it more critically, I praise the Lord for you too. Not quite as eagerly, but gr greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The saints which are, are with me greet you. All the saints here salute you, particularly those who are of Caesar's household. Okay? If, if, and if you were Caesar, if you were Caesar, or, or in this case Nero, I believe, because they were all called Caesar at the time. We're looking at Nero. I mean, if, you didn't have dumb slaves. Okay, I mean, you could give those to somebody else. These were brilliant people, capable administrators. And it does seem as though that the Lord had raised up a Bible study in those who were responsible for the administration, you know, for the running of Caesar's household. I mean, can you imagine the various theological opinions that must have been there? People that came out of Roman mythology or who knows what, you know, taught by a Hebrew who was raised under law, a Pharisee of Pharisees. I believe that's why the 23rd verse is there. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay, the, the epistle, dearly beloved, opens with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it ends with grace. And sandwiched in between is nothing but grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I think the Holy Spirit is saying that, that, that all that that we've looked at here is the new creation in Christ Jesus, the new man that we put on. That's where God's grace is. And I think the Christian community today is trying to put the grace of God in the sphere of the old man. But I don't see that concept in this amazing epistle, nor do I see it anywhere else. I want to take a moment to tell you I appreciate those of you who have followed through with us on this study. I pray for you constantly. I ask for your prayers for the direction of this ministry. I think we're going to be moving into the epistle of First John. I remind you to, to pray for our nation, pray for those who are hurting, that are struggling through the, the storm in Louisiana, the, the Gulf Coast, the coast states, Gulf Coast states. Some of them are without electricity. Uh, I love you all, I truly do. And until next time, this is Steve. Rest in him. And thanks for watching.